Will Jupiter's large moons save us from extinction? For Galileo Galilei, who saw them first on the night of January 7, 1610, those four lights accompanying Jupiter along its orbit represented just another great mystery for the astronomy of his time to solve, and that is the past. For us, in our present, they are an inexhaustible source of information about the evolution of the solar system. But for those to come in the very distant future, Jupiter's moons will be four wonderfully habitable worlds, where they will take refuge to escape the grip of the dying sun. Don't believe it? Well, I can't argue with that. No one can know how things will turn out in a billion years. But good fairy tales help us to live, don't they? So let's take a tour of the most extraordinary moons in the solar system, in space and in time. Even with just a pair of binoculars, you can see the four main satellites of Jupiter. They are not planets, because they orbit their parent planet rather than the Sun, but they are certainly planet-like. They are all roughly 3,000 to 5,000 kilometers in diameter, the smallest being slightly smaller than the Moon, the largest slightly larger than Mercury, and they are all similar to the terrestrial planets. Three sisters and a brother from a motley crew. As siblings, the satellites have a family resemblance, but are all different. Together with Jupiter, they make a miniature planetary system, and it is thought were formed at the same time as Jupiter in much the same way that our solar system was formed. Fundamentally, they are rocky, but their position far out in the solar system means that with one exception, they have retained the original ices they accrued from the solar nebula. Water and ice have played a considerable part in their lives, although one of them now lives a dry life of fiery eruptions. We on the Earth lie in the same orbital plane in which the four satellites revolve around Jupiter, so to us they seem to line up in a row, moving back and forth from side to side, sometimes passing in front of Jupiter and casting a shadow on its cloud tops and sometimes hiding, either obscured behind it or in its shadow. Their periods lie roughly between a day and two weeks, so they change their positions while you watch them from night to night or even from hour to hour through the night. When they move into Jupiter's shadow and are eclipsed, their light is extinguished in a few minutes, fading progressively until what is called the last speck of light is extinguished. The satellites remain as seen from Earth as points of light, but we know their structure from the visits of four space probes. The Voyager spacecraft 1 and 2 flew by Jupiter in 1979. Galileo was the first spacecraft to enter into orbit around Jupiter in 1995 and was able to make extensive observations over eight years. A second probe, Juno, entered orbit around Jupiter in 2016. These space probes have revealed the landscapes of Jupiter's satellites as in one case a volcanic desert and in others an Antarctic continent of rocks, icebergs and cold, cold oceans. The Fabulous Four are called the Galilean satellites because they were discovered by Galileo in the first two weeks of 1610 with his new telescope. On the first night, he saw only three stars, two on one side of Jupiter and one on the other. He saw three again on the second night, but all of them were on the same side of Jupiter. He thought at first that they were a chance line of three stars and that the change was due to the motion of Jupiter through the three. A couple of nights later, there were only two, and then a few nights later, there were four. They became known as Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, all of them in mythology, Jupiter's lovers of both sexes. Io, a hellish world. The closest of Jupiter's moons to the planet is Io, the fourth largest satellite in the solar system and the densest of all at 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter. The entire surface of Io is coated with black rocks mixed with sulfur, yellow, orange, and red in its different forms, like a medieval picture of hell. There are almost no meteor craters, showing that the surface is young and that geological processes have erased craters that have formed earlier. However, the surface of Io is pitted like an acne-scarred face. The pits are mostly not meteor craters. They are calderas among mountains taller than any on Earth and lava flows, some of them cold and solid, others hot and flowing. It is a volcanic landscape. In fact, with more than 300 active volcanoes, Io is the most geologically active object in the solar system. The ground is made up of solidified mounds of smooth black lava and loose jagged rocks, where the land has been sectioned by the explosion of a volcano that had excavated a crater, drifts of yellow or orange ash are exposed. 
In the still active areas, there are vents of steam and sulfurous gas, heat radiating from the red, molten lava oozing from below. As the coldest of the satellites to its parent planet, Io is squeezed and relaxed by strong tidal forces originating in Jupiter. The heat generated by this repeated working of Io's interior has melted its rocks and created about 400 volcanoes, some so active they shoot lava 400 kilometers into the sky. The volcanoes on Io were discovered in the images of the Voyager 1 space probe during its flight through Jupiter's system of satellites. As the encounter was ending and the spacecraft was tracking away from Jupiter and its satellites, behind them was a particular star that was dimmed by a kind of cloud, very large, just above Io's surface. The cloud positioned over a heart-shaped feature on Io was an ash cloud from a volcano, now named Pele, after the Hawaiian goddess of volcanoes and the heart-shaped feature was the volcano itself, with its slopes, ejecta, and lava flows. And this was the first volcanic activity outside the Earth that anyone had ever witnessed. Io is only a little larger than our own moon. It is slightly ellipsoidal, the shape of a rugby football or an American football. Jupiter's tidal forces have locked onto the long axis, which points towards the parent planet, so that, like all the Galilean satellites, Io gazes at Jupiter with the same face all the time. Its rocky surface is all but ice-free. Presumably, the volcanic heat has evaporated all the water and is coated with sulfur. Its colors are the colors of different forms of sulfur. Material ejected by the volcanoes forms a thin atmosphere and feeds into Jupiter's magnetosphere. The volcanoes generate lava flows hundreds of kilometers long and hundreds of times the volumes of recent flows from volcanoes on Earth, bulldozing earlier deposits into deep channels. The extensive volcanic activity is built around 150 mountains on Io, the tallest of which exceeded Mount Everest in height. Io's life is one of stress. Although imprisoned in the tight grip of Jupiter's gravitational field, its body is never at rest. It is always in fits, always fevered, bleeding and twisting. Perhaps the least sympathetic of the Galilean satellites and the one that will give the most trouble for possible future colonization. Its average diameter is 3,640 kilometers, and it orbits Jupiter with a period of 1.77 days at a distance of 421,800 kilometers from the planet's center and 350,000 kilometers from the top of its clouds. Its average temperature is minus 143 degrees Celsius, with very faint traces of an atmosphere. Hang on a sec, guys, before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell, you will help us to make products of even higher quality. Europa, beautiful and glacial. Europa is the second nearest Galilean satellite to Jupiter. By contrast to fiery Io, Europa is a world covered with cold ice, as smooth and completely spherical as a billiard ball. It is almost featureless. Only the nearly sunken traces of a few recent meteor craters break the monotony of a white, flat landscape. The ice is cracked into flows, with mineralized water splashing and oozing up through the gaps, overflowing onto the surface, staining it in a spider's web of red threads. The red stains are traces of deposits left by the evaporating water. Europa looks like a world in stasis, but there is activity below its icy surface. The ice is a kilometer thick, floating on an ocean of salty water perhaps five kilometers deep. The water is warmed from below by geothermal energy. When the ice flows thrust together, they make hills of ice on the surface, but they are only a couple of hundred meters high. The landscape here is similar to the Arctic Sea around the coasts of northern Canada or Siberia. Altogether, there is more water on Europa than there is on Earth. In some future space mission, Ender might settle on the ice and try to penetrate through the ice layer, perhaps by using a radioactive probe to melt the ice and work its way down through the meltwater. It would be a suicide mission for the probe as the water would refreeze above it, sealing it in. But what would it find? The still waters of Europa run deep, and it is tempting to imagine that as it breaks through the lower surface of the ice, the penetrating probe might shine its lamps on alien oceanic creatures, taking pictures of them swimming below the maze of ice flows. Okay, these are just dreams for the time being, and it is perhaps best to play it safe. As safe as these measurements are, trivial, but established. With a diameter of just over 3,100 kilometers, Europa is slightly smaller than the Moon and is the sixth largest satellite and the 15th largest object in the solar system. 
Its density of 3 grams per cubic centimeter suggests that it is similar in composition to terrestrial planets, being predominantly composed of silicates. Europa orbits Jupiter with a period of about three and a half days at a distance of 670,900 kilometers. It too with a hemisphere constantly facing Jupiter. The average temperature on the surface is minus 170 degrees Celsius. Observations using the Hubble Space Telescope onboard spectrograph revealed the presence of a tenuous atmosphere composed of oxygen. Perhaps the most promising Galilean. Who knows? Ganymede the Big and Callisto the Loner. And then further outward, we find Ganymede, with a diameter of 5,262 kilometers, is the largest of the Galilean moons. Indeed, the largest moon in the solar system. And even further away is Callisto, which is almost as big, the third largest moon in the solar system, as big as Mercury, but a third as massive. This means that they are both much less dense than planets made of rock and iron. The two moons must be mixed with something much lighter. That something is water, liquid water, and ice. Both Ganymede and Callisto have rocky surfaces that are cratered like the Moon and Mercury. They look like the Moon, particularly Ganymede, which has two sorts of surface. A third of it is dark in color with lots of craters, thus very old. The other, two-thirds, is lighter in color, not so cratered, so younger. Its peculiarity is that it is laced with grooves and ridges. The lighter terrain on Ganymede is like the Moon's Maria, caused by the upwelling of molten material from the interior that flooded lower areas of the surface. The difference is that the upwelling was not lava, but water melted by an asteroid impact. Callisto is similar with parts of its surface lying in ripples, waves frozen by the intense cold. Ganymede has an iron core that produces a weak magnetic field, but not Callisto. Their big secret is that several lines of argument point to both satellites having, under the rocky surface, a liquid ocean of salty water. The ocean hidden in Ganymede is perhaps 1,000 kilometers deep, and like Europa's ocean, holds as much or more water than on Earth. Callisto's ocean is only a few hundred kilometers deep. Like Europa's oceans, these oceans, if they do indeed exist, may have life swimming in them. There could well be a greater chance of finding life on the Galilean satellites than on Mars. But as we have already said, it is better to keep our feet on the ground and stick to the facts. Ganymede orbits Jupiter in 7.1 days at a distance of 1,070,400 kilometers, two with one hemisphere constantly facing the gas giant. Controversially, it has a very weak oxygen atmosphere, while the temperature on the surface is minus 164 degrees Celsius. In contrast, Callisto, the outermost and most isolated of the four Galileans, has a diameter of 4,821 kilometers and orbits in 16.7 days at a distance from Jupiter of 1,868,000 kilometers. It is also the least dense of the four, with a density of just 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter. The temperature on the surface averages minus 153 degrees Celsius, while the almost non-existent atmosphere is mostly made up of traces of carbon dioxide. This, as we said at the beginning, is the present, made up of exciting photographs, surveys, and data. A present that tells us about four worlds of wild and hostile nature. But it is in the future that Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto will perhaps find a chance to serve the cause of the survival of the human species. In a billion years, in fact, as the sun begins to emit more heat and set on the path of becoming a red giant, the habitable zone of the solar system will shift outward by at least a half a billion kilometers, and Jupiter's satellite system will find itself right in the middle of the zone. This will mean a rise in temperature for the four Galileans, leading to the melting of ice and the release of large amounts of gas. Atmospheres will form. How conducive to life as we know it cannot be predicted, but surely those inhospitable worlds will be able to help our species substantially to escape from the increasingly torrid Earth. Of course, if we are still there, and if we have the technological means to cope with the enormous logistical problems that may arise. And in any case, going to Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto will always be better and easier than searching for new Earths among the very remote array of extrasolar planets. What do you guys think about this?